reading Tuesday, December 9th. Um, and if we will all rise to um, say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Okay, first, we do have one adjustment to tonight's agenda, and that will be that there will be no executive session um, following this public session. Um, also, let's see, the November school board minutes. Are there any comments um, or concerns on the November minutes? No, they are approved. Um, and we'll move on to comments from our high school students, our Rebecca and Michael here. I'm Rebecca Taylor. Um, students are continuing to learn at the high school and the work is piling up as we approach the deadlines that are always placed right before the liberation of winter break. The swim team won their first meet and the boys basketball team lost their first game by only one point. Um, students don't hibernate at CEHS, rather they are out participating in winter sports like swimming and diving, basketball, cross country skiing and indoor track, as well as extracurriculars. Geshe Lobsang Tassan, a Buddhist monk, visited on December 1st and spoke to a fundraising group about the Siddhartha School, which he founded in Ladakh, Tibet, to educate children about their cultural past while ensuring their ability to succeed in a globalized society. The children learn four languages beginning at the age of five. The Siddhartha School group established in the high school is holding a raffle and has sold soda at two middle school dances to raise money. Amnesty International is also very visible in the school, as their information meet the glances of students in the hallways. Faces of the world peer out from posters that describe human rights violations. The theater program is assembling a cast for the one-act play, which will compete in the regionals and perhaps go further in the competition. The Bartleby Group has published a teaser of poetic and artistic works that will hopefully entice students to submit in record numbers to the annual literary magazine. The Cape Insight, our newspaper, will be going to press tomorrow, and I encourage you all to read it to glean a more comprehensive idea of what, of what is going on in the high school student-wise. The Student Advisory Council met tonight, and the Academic Committee proposed and passed an initiative to hold focus groups that have been carefully assembled to provide a diverse group of answers to questions about homework and class leveling. The results of an SAC survey based on ca the cafeteria, respect, dress code, and extracurricular eligibility issues are being tabulated. And tomorrow, the first of three student-led roundtables will be held to encourage input about improvement and making students more comfortable. Uh, with all this energy and effort being put into positive ch change, coupled with recently passed renovations to the high school, our school environment can only improve. Thank you. I'm Michael Iris, a uh, high school senior. Just to touch up on what, what Rebecca said, uh, winter sports have started. Uh, the first basketball games have gone to JV basketball game, uh, girls basketball, I think just ended. Um, notes from the uh, SA seating meetings was there was talk about returning the caffeinated beverages to the cafeteria with a compromise possibly of being restricted to certain times of the day. Uh, the academics committee committee decided on making uh, two focus groups for discussion about student preparation for research papers and the difference between AP honors and CP classes. Uh, the, uh, the climate committee was thinking about making a mur uh, mural between the hallway, between the gym and the pool area for a project. And um, there was also talk about the up upcoming activities for Winterfest and Respect Day, in which uh, possibly a speaker would come and talk about respect. I just had a, I had a question. I remember hearing about the lack of caffeinated beverages at the first meeting, and I just wondered what the process was for seeing those return. Um, we're, we're currently in the process of uh, trying to compromise because there was concerns about um, uh, caffeinated beverages being consumed at early morning and kids overusing them. So I think, I think, if, Mr. Shed would allow it that um, 
we're thinking about having just caffeinated beverages between the two lunches, and then maybe after school, and then that would work. Yeah. So I was just wondering, was that a student effort? Was it an organized uh, it, it, it was sort of, Yeah, it was a SAC effort. I see, SAC. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, and I have a question for Rebecca. The roundtable discussions that you were talking about that the students will have, yeah. will we be able to hear the results of that next month? Um, I think the roundtables are being uh, conducted through the guidance department, and there's actually a class, um, an honors leader leadership seminar, which meets during school hours, and they've sort of put that together. But I would think that... Um, because that what were some of the topics that you said you were discussing? Um, well, in those, I'm not sure, I'm not part of that, but I, they're going to talk about making students more comfortable in the school, and it's the first of three um, roundtable discussions, and they've been going on since last, since for the past two years, I guess, and they've sort of changed as they've gone along. But independently of that, the SAC also recently did a survey, and then the academic committee is questioning a focus group. So it just seems to me like there's a lot of energy going towards um, sort of evaluating things. And I think that's been spurred by the fact that there's going to be the evaluation by the um, accreditation. Accreditation. Because yeah. um, I think I would be interested to hear some of yeah. the results of what the students are saying. Okay. Yeah, those are the SAC surveys being tabulated. And I'll talk to the guidance department about what was discussed in the round. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Now we can hear from the middle school from Kevin and Nora. I'm Nora Daly, and um, recently we just had our last dance, and it went really well. Also, right now we're beginning the Adopt a Family, where we're going to purchase presents, the student council is. And all winter sports have begun. Um, cross-country skiing and swimming? Um, a couple weeks back, we sponsored the WMJS food drive, and we had like a week to gather as many cans as we can. And like halfway through the week, we only had 50 cans. But by the end, we rallied together to get 900. And yet again, the laptops are going very well. And there's not really much going on. <laughs> <laughs> the report cards came out today also. Okay. Um, any comments or questions for Kevin or Nora? Nothing. Okay, thank you. And now we can move on to um, communications. Um, in everyone's packet, we received letters that are, are going to the Commissioner of Education regarding the construction and renovation projects. And this is a process that um, we need to go through with the state asking for their approval um, to do both of these projects. There are two separate letters, one for each school. Is that how? Yes, and, and um, even though it's a locally funded project, we still have to have approvals from the, the State Board of Education. Okay. Um, and also in, the, in your packets are the MSBA resolutions for 2003-2004. Um, Kevin was our delegate um, at the Augusta Clinic, who was, was part of the votes for these resolutions. Um, and are there any comments or questions on anything? Um, the packet of resolutions we got are all of the standing resolutions that the main school board association has adopted over the years. Um, the relevant uh, resolutions are under, uh, at the end of the report, and they deal with uh, the school boards and the membership's concerns with No Child Left Behind and uh, various funding items. Uh, and I hope we'll, everyone will take a close look at them because they do ident identify serious issues confronting the entire state, individual school boards, as well as us. So. Okay, thank you. Um, and next, um, the article that was in the journal regarding um, video conferencing at our middle school. Um, and I would just like to say this is very exciting. Um, I've been part of the sabbatical leave uh, committee for um, the past few years, and we always uh, 
look forward to teachers coming and asking for sabbaticals and specifically for purposes that we feel will benefit um, professional development and um, a good portion of our staff. And this is a perfect example of um, something that Jill came to um, to us several years ago um, for a sabbatical on technology. And through the whole process and, and through everything that she did, um, she was able to bring video conferencing and the Bronx Zoo into her classroom. And from that point, uh, she had invited Angus King to be part of this video conferencing. Susan Collins um, was part of a uh, conference with eighth graders last year uh, talking about um, government issues and the war in Iraq. And from some of, and, and she also has participated with a French teacher um, with other students in England. Um, you know, speaking the language and just talking about different things that they do. Um, it, it's a wonderful opportunity and we are the only school in the entire state of Maine that has the capability of video conferencing out of our state. Um, and I believe there aren't even high schools that do this, are there? I don't think so. Some, there might be some colleges. The other piece of this too is this Friday, uh, the New England School Development Council, which is um, one of the better known professional development um, organizations um, in New England and is based out of Harvard, um, is conducting a video conference um, from Boston to Cape Elizabeth and their whole goal is down the road how they can bring professional development into the state of Maine via the video conference and right now we're the place that they're, they're using to, to test that out so there might be some exciting opportunities for that also. And, and I, I'd just like to add that um, you know because of Jill um, we are becoming a model for distance learning for the entire state of Maine in video conferencing which I think is quite an accomplishment. Um, and Marie, I, I, for those people who don't get a chance, it's, it's a very good article, it's a first person narrative. It's also available on www.thejournal.com. It's a November 2003 issue, so if you get a chance to look at that, it's very good. Okay, thank you. Okay, and next we have a, um, a statement from Kevin Sweeney regarding um, poli a policy BCB. Yes, at the uh, November 18th, 2003 public workshop meeting of this school board, I was allowed to read a statement to the attending members of the board, policy subcommittee, and administration. The statement provided information relative to the first reading of policy BCB, board member conflict of interest. I expected that night to be the last time I had the opportunity to collaborate with the board and the policy committee. Since that time, my plans changed and I have had ample time and opportunity to discuss the information with interested parties and the attendees of the public policy subcommittee meeting of December 3rd, 2003. In my opinion, the information does not promote or advance the goals of this board. More importantly, it does nothing to address the needs or challenges of our students and stakeholders. Accordingly, it is superfluous and counterproductive to repeat at this time. Thank you. Okay. So, so later on under new business, we will be reading the um, policy. Um, I also have one thing um, to mention that there were um, subcommittee appointments for our new school board members. Um, Kathy Ray is on our finance committee and Richard is on our policy committee. And we still do have one committee with an opening, which is technology. Um, if either one of you were interested. Kathy? Okay. Okay. And all, all of our subcommittees have well, I'm been I'm on the filled. refreshments committee. It's a new one this year. Okay. And now we can move on to recognition. We have some real exciting news tonight. Um, we have um, seven students who are um, semi-finalists and commended students 
um, for the National Merit Semi-Finalists. Um, Out of over 1 million students in over 20,000 high schools entered into this program, fewer than 5% of these students advanced in the competition, and less than 1% of the nation's high school seniors are ultimately named semi-finalists, and we have five. The National Merit, as, uh, as Maria had said, the National Merit Recognition Program is really a program that calls out those students who have really um, excelled in the, in the preliminary scholastic aptitude test, and it's really a feather in the cap of a high school um, to have five, five semifinalists and another two that are commended is really an, quite an accomplishment for a school um, our, our size or the size of Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, I don't think there's another high school in the state uh, that comes close to having, a, usually if you have two or three, you, we feel real good, but to have five uh, is quite an accomplishment. And those people that are being recognized this evening, um, we're very proud of you and um, very proud of the high school for the work that's being done there. And you really did um, you make yourself stand out among the rest and we congratulate you for that. So we have just a, a certificate uh, from the school board to recognize your efforts. And I will read uh, the first one for a commended student. It's a certificate of recognition presented to Rebecca Taylor. This certificate is presented by the Cape Elizabeth School Board in recognition of outstanding academic achievement as a National Merit Scholarship Program commended student. Commended student Elizabeth Hay. <laughs> Elizabeth's home studying. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have five semi finalists. Uh, and again, the certificate is presented by the Cable of the School Board in recognition of outstanding academic achievement as a National Merit Scholarship Program semi finalist. And the first one is presented to Brent Amberger. Daniel Clucci. <laughs> James Francis Cohn. <laughs> Michael Palin. Sam Mowry. And Elizabeth Kayat. Thank you very much and congratulations. Now we can move on to the superintendent's report. A few items just to share with you. Uh, one, uh, the Future Direction Planning Committee will be meeting after the, the first of the year. Um, we did receive the data report from our consultant um, so that we will be looking at that data from our August uh, meeting. And I think Ann Belden and Jennifer are members of that, of that committee. Um, there will be parents involved with that process, administrators, teachers. Um, and we'll be updating our plan uh, so that we'll have the new plan in place as of September of next year. 
also is the education foundation you probably have seen the sign on route seventy seven and other posters that have been distributed um, for luminaries for education um, what the education foundation is looking to do is to raise uh, hopefully around twenty thousand dollars by selling um, I guess they're their paper bags that are lined with plastic uh, wax and they would have a candle inside weighted with sand and on December 21st um, people will be asked to place those out in, in their front yards so that uh, throughout Cape Elizabeth there will be a sign of support uh, for education. I think it's a great way um, you know, to, to, to raise money but also is a, is a real nice thing to be able to show the support the community has for education. They've also recently completed the phonathon. Um, with the preliminary figures, um, I heard last night they were very successful and were able to raise quite a bit of money with the phonathon. Um, I went to a meeting last evening with the strategic planning group. Uh, they're very interested in our future direction plan and the kinds of things that are happening uh, in the school district and really are thinking uh, in terms of how they can support some of the district-wide uh, initiatives and systems that, that we are looking toward in the future. Uh, and what support the education can, can give, not just the classroom initiatives, but the entire district. Um, school accreditation, you'll hear about, more about that this evening. Uh, the one piece I'd like to share with you, um, what um, really will help us an awful lot is the building project. Um, um, through the building project, the ADA issues, which we've heard an awful lot about, um, will be addressed. And that is something that was kind of uh, a hang-on item from the last accreditation visit. So that is something I don't think we'll see in this next accreditation visit. And the student information system administrative software uh, was discussed this evening um, at the finance committee. Um, but the school board um, gave permission for the district leadership team to, um, to purchase an administrative software package, student information system. Um, we investigated a number of programs, um, came down to two programs. Um, the high school did a lot of research. Uh, Gary Illinois did an awful lot of research for us, and each of the administrators looked at their own building needs. And we will be purchasing a program called Power School, which is an Apple product. Uh, it's a web-based system, but we really feel will help us as we move to the future and being able to access data um, and really does a lot of creative things with information, which there's more and more of today, and really being able to work as a K-12 system um, with our administrative software. Hey, and thank you. Now we can move on to the committee reports, the finance subcommittee. Jennifer? I mean, I'm sorry, Elaine? I'm, are we doing these before the principal's reports? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> okay. The principal's reports, Tom. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening. Um, you've already heard references to uh, staff development. We were discussing Jill Bell's accomplishments. I just wanted to bring you up to date on recent um, happenings in the district. You, I'm sure you're aware for the past few years we've designated the two days of Thanksgiving week for K through 12 staff development. This is uh, in the context of our knowledge that staff development happens outside of these two days, but those two days have been extremely useful. Um, Pond Cove concentrated on the learning result um, and building the comprehensive assessment system using the simple strategy of since uh, teachers at the elementary school are responsible for a wide range of content areas having a teacher on each grade level team be a designated leader or content specialist in one of the learning results areas. These teachers have the benefit, I guess, of being able to go to seminars and courses and then reporting back to their teams. And we, um, by all accounts, the two days that we had right before, before Thanksgiving gave these teachers a chance to come back, work with their teams, and then because of the preparation done by Sarah Simmons and the other members of the Curriculum Instruction Assessment Committee, they were able to link together K through four, so it was extremely successful. Um, more staff development work, I think, is uh, we have been working on literacy investigation for a number of years. The new dimension this year is a concentration on spelling within that context. 
we have learned again over the years that relying on the traditional Friday test of 20 spelling words uh, gets hundreds but doesn't make good spellers. So our goal this year is to teach kids not just what words to spell but how to spell. One of the ways we've done this is to pursue our research that we started originally with the Literacy Collaborative. We're kind of attached to the work of two uh, researcher authors, Fountas and Pinnell, who recently published a series of manuals and student material on teaching phonics and relating that to decoding and reading and writing. We have uh, four kindergarten teachers doing it and a core of pilot teachers in grade one and two who are using this work um, to see how realistic it is to do in one year. They're investigating what results they're getting from the kids. Uh, they're also linking up with grades three and four to see what changes we could make in our spelling program. So by the end of the year, we, we should have recommendations to make. Uh, incidentally, the uh, lesson study initiative is, is still going on very strong. I have to say it's, it's made a real difference in professional development. Two of these teams uh, have chosen phonics or word work as part of their lesson study. This has added great depth to their professional decision making about not just how to teach kids, but being able to observe them at work in the classroom. <laughs> Moving on to another topic that I think Tom mentioned about the um, new addition, Bob Howe came to school today during school to meet with two teams and he and a partner met with interested teachers after school to get feedback about the, the nuts and bolts of the, of the design. He'll be back in the morning to meet with the pupil services team to go over the placement of the occupational therapy room and it's kind of exciting to hear discussion about bookcases and lockers and even bathrooms. It means it's really going to happen. And one final announcement for any kids who might be watching tonight, um, the behavior of the Patriots fans notwithstanding, snowball throwing is still against the rules at Pond Cove. We had a little outbreak this week. <laughs> questions? Any questions or comments? Thank you, Tom. Okay. okay. Um, Jeff? have a more extended presentation later about the school mission, so I'm going to keep this really brief. Uh, we had a visit today, even though our accreditation visit is still almost two years away, but not quite two years away. We had a visit today from Janet Allison, who is our NEASC designated uh, liaison person from that organization. She met today with our standards committees, chairs, our steering committee, and the entire faculty after school to sort of go over the process, and she was very reassuring about where we are in terms of our organization and the process. Um, we will be having progress reports sent out on Friday from school for students who are in, in, in academic danger in any way. Um, and the issue of, of common assessments um, is one that's becoming quite real uh, to some students. Um, in English and math this year in particular, we are working through a number of logistical details, particularly around the state requirement uh, dictated by the need to be fair to students um, to provide the students an opportunity to replace a <coughs> poor score on a common assessment with a better score on a common assessment, and essentially by giving an alternative later assessment. And so our English and math departments are struggling through sort of the logistics around that, uh, but it is becoming quite real for students. And for the most part, they seem to be taking those very seriously um, and giving them their best effort. And I think the results so far have been better than we had, we had expected. But there are legit issues that are, that are coming up that we are working through, providing makeup sessions for students and then uh, op optional times to make up the assessment itself. Makeups, makeup sessions to help them get, get over the content hurdles that cause them not to do as well as they would like the first time around, followed by opportunities for replacement assessments. So we're in the midst of that in those two subjects. Questions? No. Thank, you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Nancy. Good evening. Just a couple of announcements to start off. First of all, um, tomorrow night we start off with our musical winter concerts. And tomorrow night at the Cafetorium, it's starting at 7 p.m., we have the sixth grade band will be performing and the fifth and sixth grade chorus. Followed by the next evening, Thursday evening at 7 p.m. in the Cafetorium, we'll have the seventh and eighth grade bands and the seventh and eighth grade chorus. So we encourage people to come and to enjoy some music and see how far we've gotten in our first trimester of work. On 
December 22nd, our Tuesday morning jazz group will perform for the fifth and sixth grade performance group and students during school, and this will start at 8. And followed by Tuesday and December 23rd, the Thursday jazz group will perform for the seventh and eighth grade students. Last year, we put the jazz groups with the other bands in it. It caused a bit of a problem for the population that wanted to attend. Our cafetorium is not quite big enough. It's the reason that in the springtime we have our concerts in the high school. We have a lot of wonderful students participating in our music programs, and that is a wonderful, it's a wonderful dilemma to have that we have no space big enough for all of our musical groups and the people who would like to hear them. But we also came to the realization that with the jazz groups, this would, if we did it during the school time, it would give us an opportunity to talk to our students about how you attend a jazz concert, and that it's the audience for a jazz concert is actually a little bit different than for the band concert in that you applaud for solos and that that will be an interruption um, throughout and that people understand that. And so Terry White came up with this idea that for the winter season, our jazz groups would actually perform during the school day. We would like to invite um, parents to come to that if they would like to. Our seating is rather limited, um, our middle school is just growing in popularity. We have 618 students. We don't all fit in the cafetorium, but we didn't all fit in the cafetorium when we were only 586 students either, so it's not a new problem, but even by splitting it down half, we don't have room for many, many people, but we certainly have room for um, parents who would like to come and hear their sons and daughters from the Tuesday and the Thursday morning. Those are the eighth grade jazz groups. Our seventh grade jazz group will not be ready to perform until the spring just as at this time our fifth grade band isn't ready to perform until the spring, so they're not on this concert docket. But many of you would have a moment in the next few days to come and listen to some great music. Um, please stop by, and we'll certainly find space for you. Let's see, a couple of other upcoming things for our students before our next school board meeting. They, we do have some student leadership and participation activities coming up on January 7th. We'll be sending six representatives from our student council and six representatives from our civil rights team to a student leadership conference at St. Joseph's College. This is sponsored by the Triple C. Um, that is also the conference people most often associate our athletic events with, but we also organize several other conferences and in different areas throughout the year. Mark Brown, who is a noted motivational speaker for young people, will be the keynote presenter, and there will be other presentations that our students can attend. With this is a conference we offer every other year. Because it's at St. Joseph's, we've also, this will be our second year, we share transportation with Scarborough Middle School. We take everybody over, and Scarborough Middle School picks us up and brings us back. And last time we found that that was one of the best parts of the conference was having the, middle, the Cape Elizabeth Middle School students and the Scarborough Middle School students ride together and talk about what they were going to do at the conference and then talk about what they did do at the conference. So it's just a little added opportunity that gives us for a little bit of mingling. Also, Beverly Bisbee has been very active with the organization of the first student I-team conference, and this is directly related to our laptops and that is scheduled for Saturday, January 10th. It's an 8 to 2.30 event, and schools will be allowed to send members of their I-teams to this conference. It's going to be held at the new Gorham Middle School, so it'll give us an opportunity to see that new facility, and also to participate in events organized around the students and with technology, and for students who are really interested in technology to have a chance to see a few things that are a little bit extra. So those are particular student leadership things that are coming up for our students to participate in. As Marie mentioned with Jill Bell's sabbatical several years ago, bring video conferencing to us, it's really opened up a lot of the opportunities and things that we've been able to do to go beyond the doors of Cape Elizabeth. Also on a much lesser note, because we had to use um, some technology that perhaps wasn't quite as elaborate, uh, we recently did a conference with the Clayton, Missouri schools that I believe I mentioned at our last school board meeting, and we did Gary Lenoy, Bev Bisbee, and I presented to a group of teachers in Clayton, Missouri about using laptops and about the one-on-one -on -one technology available for students. Um, it was very interesting. We tested it three, two times. It worked great. Third time, we're on to do our presentation. There was a glitch. We could get no sound. Um, but we used a cell phone and the little eyesight camera and 
there we were in Clayton, Missouri. So um, it was lovely to do and a great opportunity to meet and talk with those people that some of us have had a chance to meet with at other times as they're in our coalition um, for improving schools with us. Tom mentioned that our, on our workshop in November, we certainly participated in the learning results work that everyone did on that Monday and on Tuesday, people followed up with other projects as well. We also took time as a staff to really begin to plan more about our flex day. I think I mentioned this to you before, that we were gonna take some feedback from students, which we did, and then mingle it together with our own ideas. And it seems that that day in June is gonna be devoted to some sorts of work about a sense of belonging for both students and adults so that we can increase the respect um, throughout our building. We have a committee of interested teachers who are gonna more carefully organize that day. And we had a very lively exchange of ideas about what would work on that day and what might not work on that day. So I think it will certainly be a productive day when we get to that. The, when Tom Priscilla was mentioning the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, we have an opportunity for two of our fifth grade classrooms are gonna be involved in that and on Friday they have a chance, they have a homeroom guidance program. They're going to take part of that time and they're going to help create some of those illuminaries by loading sand and candles into the bags. And they are very excited about being part of that. And these are the people on Megan Crabtree and Kathy Walsh's team. And I, my understanding is from an email I received today that Channel 8 will be there to broadcast that. So if Friday evening you're looking for some fun things to watch on television, you might turn on and see some of our fifth graders um, on television um, as they do this particular project. And just want to end my report with, just as we were talking about sabbaticals and other kinds of things, this week we've been welcoming Mar Margaret Welch back from her trip to Japan. It was a wonderful opportunity for her. She has brought back many ideas and thoughts and just the experience of another culture to share with classes. Um, for myself personally, it also was a wonderful time because why Margaret was away, I get to go in and teach her classes. Um, and that was great because the best part of that for me was getting to know 27 of our students a little bit better than I know some of the others, and it was a tremendous thrill. Um, I will tell you, the students, we worked hard on many things, but one of the things we did is to prepare an interview with Margaret today and to come to some powerful questions. And they've been having a great time interviewing her about all of the things that she learned while she was away. So it's been great fun. Thank you. Nancy, can I, um, the jazz band for the eighth grade, when is that? It is, we have two jazz band, jazz groups in the eighth grade. The Thursday morning. The Thursday morning group is December 23rd. The okay. Tuesday morning group is December 22nd. So Tuesday goes on Monday. Thursday goes on Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Okay, and now we can move on to the committee reports. Um, finance subcommittee, Elaine. Um, yes, the finance subcommittee met for the hour prior to uh, tonight's regular meeting. Um, in addition to <coughs> signing the warrants and reviewing the appropriation reports, uh, we did hear from Ernie McVeigh. Um, on the 0405 uh, capital improvement plan uh, proposed budget uh, for us to take a look at. Um, there was some good discussion about some of the items um, and the effects the projects would have on some of those items. Um, but overall, um, it was a, a very thorough and in intensive opportunity for us to take a look at furniture and duct work. <laughs> <laughs> We also um, had Pauline presented to us the Power School Student Information System lease that we talked about that we'll be voting on um, approving later on. There was um, some good news from the state in that we did receive additional funding over and above what we thought we might get for our bus purchase from last year. Um, so we were made aware of that. Um, there was also some discussion regarding the uh, contract for the Pond Cove construction with HKTA um, and we have decided that we would be having, um, in addition to having the Bureau of General Services which is required to look at this contract, we will be having um, Drummond and Woodson take a look at it uh, but we will be voting on it this evening based on their um, having approved it, given us their insight. So that's pretty much it as far as finance tonight. 
Okay. Thanks, Elaine. Um, policy, Jennifer. Uh, policy committee met on when, uh, Tuesday last week, but I was unable to go, so I'm going to let either Richard or Tom tell you what happened. Uh, uh, we reviewed um, the uh, suggestions that were made to the um, policy BCB, the um, conflict of interest nepotism policy from our legal counsel. Um, the changes that were suggested were quite significant. Um, so the, the feeling of the policy committee um, was to bring them back to the board uh, an extra time so that this would in essence be the first reading um, and they would come again next month just because that there were so many questions um, and it, it doesn't look the same as it did. I think the content is basically the same. It's just presented, I think, in a, in a much cleaner fashion. Um, so our suggestion from the policy committee is that this be considered a first reading for that particular policy. So any suggestions board members might have this evening, those will have time to bring those back to the policy committee um, and make additional changes if you so desire and then bring it back for another reading. Okay, thank you. Um, and back to Elaine, the building committee. Uh, yes, the building committee um, met on December 2nd, which was last week. Um, and I just want to let the public know that a little bit about the building committee. Um, it is um, a town appointed committee. We do have three school board members on it, three town council members. There are three citizens. Um, and they are pretty much um, hearing and making decisions at this point that will carry us to the point uh, where we'll start construction. Um, and we also have some extra members of this committee. Um, Mike McGovern and Tom Fasella are there for their guidance and input. Um, we've also had uh, Ernie McVean come because of his knowledge of a lot of the buildings and the sites and where lines are. Um, Keith Weatherby also attended um, because we're looking for some of his input because it does involve the athletic fields. And then we do have the administrators, uh, Jeff Shedd and, and Tom Eismeyer, of course, because they're directly involved with what's going to be happening in their schools um, over the next two, two years. Um, to this point, I just wanted to share with the public that um, the work has started. We have uh, had some test pits that have been done, um, both at Pond Cove and High School. We've started to run the construction management ads, looking for firms that would be interested in ha helping us handle that project at the high school level. Um, we are en route to Augusta as a building committee on December 16th, where we'll be, be presenting to the Bureau of General Services a, an application for alternative delivery, which is the construction management um, aspect of the high school renovation and we will look for their approval on that even though it is a locally funded project we do have to go up there and make that appeal um, we did listen to a presentation by tom greer and bob howe tom greer is the site engineer um, there was a lot of uh, discussion as far as the work that would be done in the parking lots the um, ada walkways uh, the lower field and some of the traffic studies would be seeing um, Jeff Shedd also shared some information with the building committee that there's an interest on the part of a citizen group um, to look at some fundraising um, to perhaps enhance the lower field with um, an artificial turf. The building committee shared with um, Jeff what their plan, what they would like to see from that committee and I assume he'll be taking that back um, and a timeline with them. Um, after a discussion of some of the site work, it was kind of decided that, that there would probably be a need to do some prior, prioritization, uh, I guess I want to call it, because if there was some unexpected costs that might arise over the two years of these projects, that there was concern that was there going to be enough money in a contingency fund. and. Um, this was only because there have been some projects across the state that do run into some unexpected problems. And it was then decided that perhaps the site work that we were looking at at that moment would be where some of those um, things would need to be prioritized. Um, so the dis consensus was that 
bob howe would continue by going to the planning board in the months of january, february, and march for the approval of these projects um and some of the site work but that we would wait until we had the construction manager on board for some recommendations and then delay the site work later in the the project so that we could get a feel for where the costs were coming in so that's just to keep everybody up to date um i also just wanted to note that the minutes of the building committee are going to be posted on the town's website um they do have to go back to the building committee for approval so that they'll be probably one month late but you will be able to read them on the town website and school board members will be receiving them in their packets every month um as they become available so um i think that's where we were at the building committee okay thanks elaine um we have no unfinished business so we'll move on to new business um the first thing on our list is uh consideration for the superintendent's recommendations for co-curricular fee positions um for this year do we have a motion well, let me um i have the following um recommendations for uh, co-curricular positions at pond cove um one is in uh, the uh theatrics program that's Kristen Thomas um and director Crystal Thorne and those are the only two positions and again these are recommendations to the board and they are uh positions that have been budgeted for Do you have a motion Elaine I move that we approve uh the two recommendations for the co-curricular positions Okay Any comments or questions Okay Kevin Okay. All those in favor? 7-0. <coughs> also, um you have in in your packet uh recommendations um for uh athletic fee positions and there are as follows Sarah Kinsella, 8th grade girls basketball, Jeremy LaRose, indoor track, Joe Doan, indoor track. and Charles Carroll assistant indoor track. Okay, do we have a motion? I move that we accept the recommendations for the um athletic fee positions as presented. Okay. Second. Jennifer, comments or questions? All those in favor? 7-0. And next there is a um teaching position um as you are aware we had a grade 1 um teacher um that had resigned uh which created an opening um, the Pond Cove school um followed the new hiring procedures um that we put in place last year um what you have in front of you is a list of the people that were on the interview team uh, the number of candidates that were interviewed um in a just a brief few bullets about what what their rationale is for that recommendation and then there's a bit of background um for the candidate so the candidate that is being brought before the board this evening for the grade 1 teaching position uh is Julie Nickerson okay do we have a motion um to accept this teaching position Kevin I move that we accept the superintendent's nomination for uh, Julie Nickerson as a first grade teacher. Okay, second. Second. Um and um any comments or questions? Yeah, just to uh inform people since this is the first time I actually I've I've seen a um in this I guess it's a new process too, right? Mm-hmm. Um this the interviewing team is comprised of a principal, a teacher leader, parent, a grade 1 team leader as well as the reading teacher. So it was a a group of individuals who would probably reflect a diversity of viewpoints. So this wasn't a, a team of just one or two teachers that was selecting this and I know particularly people who may be unfamiliar with the process of of selecting teachers this is an important protocol to undertake particularly since we want to make sure we have all voices heard. Any other comments? Kevin? Question. Um obviously the references have been checked already. Uh, what about the background check? Um does that happen before or after I mean, you know, 
before or after uh, hiring? That happens before. It does. Uh, in, in the last phase of the process would be that I, I interview the finalists. So I, have, uh, I did interview the particular candidate. And in this case, um, as you can see, is the background is a bit different. Um, very interesting candidate being from, um, from England. Um, but I think we'll really add an awful lot to the school um, just because it, sometimes it's great to have a different perspective and a different viewpoint on, on things. So I think we really were able to attract someone that uh, their background will really benefit us, especially it seems they have a lot of work in the literacy. Thank you. Has she just been teaching one day now or a couple How? days? Two days? Yeah. Mm. Well, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> But again, until she's approved, she's as a, she's as a substitute until this meeting tonight, and then we'll be able to have her under contract. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No. All those in favor? Seven zero. Okay. Um, Next on our list is the consideration of the re-election of the superintendent of schools. And, and what this is, is it's, um, we, um, ha we send official notification to the state verifying the employment um, of our superintendent, which he is in the first year of a new three-year contract. Um, and each year we send up the contract information and any adjustments that are made. Um, so we need a motion to accept this. Kevin? I move that we re-elect Dr. Thomas Vassellor as superintendent of the Cape Elizabeth School District with pleasure. Uh, second? Second. Ann? Um, any comments or questions? None. All those in favor? Seven zero. Okay, thank you. Um, next on our list is the consideration of approval of the mission uh, and expectation statements for our high school accreditation process. And Jeff will speak to this. Revisiting a high school mission statement is really the first step uh, in the accreditation process. Uh, it's the sort of kickoff point that begins the self-study process that's going to begin for us in late January, early February, where the various standards committees, which have already been organized, actually begin to look at how the high school is doing in relationship to the things that we identify in the mission statement as most, accept most important to us. So it's, a, it's an important document. Um, the, standards that NIESC has adapted in the past few years and has revised substantially in the past few years um, are intended uh, to make the mission statement have the effect of being, being much more of a living document, I think, and much more of a, uh, a real document and a prioritized document about uh, what's, what's really important. And I've given to you two documents. Um, the first is a, is a longer document that contains a table with three columns in it, if you've all got that in your packet, I think. And the leftmost column basically contains the language from the NIASC uh, mission standard, describes the criteria that a standard at an accredited school must meet. And then the middle paragraph contains the language that I'm bringing forward to the board tonight for its consideration. And then the last paragraph, the last column on the right, contains a brief description of the work that we still, still remain to be done uh, under the new standard, provided the board adopts uh, the mission and the academic and civic and social expectations that are part of the mission statement. The second document is a, is a one-page document that just has the mission language itself. As I was looking at it tonight, I realized that I had given you, it, it's, it's an, it, actually a marked up earlier version of the document that's actually a little, a slightly with a, couple, with a couple of words, a little bit inconsistent with the one that I've got on the table document that I've given to you. And the language in the, tape, in the document in the table is the correct language, the language I'm bringing to you. And I have revised one pager that you can substitute, which is identical to the language, I believe, in the table that I've given.
And I thought that for the benefit of the uh, audience in the room who doesn't have copies of, of what the board is considering and for the benefit of whoever is watching this over the television, that it, since this is a short document and I think relatively jargon free, uh, and that's sort of a point of pride for the committee, uh, although perhaps not 100% jargon free, that it might be worthwhile just briefly reading the statement, the mission statement draft that the board has before it to consider tonight. The mission statement itself would read as follows. All students entering Cape Elizabeth High School will graduate equipped with a personal plan for the future and with well-rounded skills and knowledge. Cape Elizabeth High School will challenge students to reach their potential and to demonstrate self-confidence, respect for others, and responsibility for their community. Under the academic expectations part of the document, which is part of uh, the requirement under the, the accreditation agency process, uh, our academic expectations, if the board adopts the mission statement, would read as follows. All students will learn to write proficiently, read well and reflectively, conduct appropriate and in-depth research, express themselves clearly in oral presentations, and analyze information and solve problems. Goes on to say, before graduation, students will demonstrate proficiency in each required content area as measured by school-wide assessments. Under the civic and social expectations uh, portion of the draft, it would state all students will demonstrate ethical and responsible behavior, treat others the way they would like to be treated, and demonstrate a spirit of cooperation and teamwork. So that's the language that's before the board and the, and the information in the right hand most column on that document with the table describes to you again uh, the steps that we still need to do to sort of flesh out the bones of those statements in the draft mission statement. I wanted to just comment briefly on the process that we went through um, bringing about uh, the draft language that's before the board tonight. We have spoken to parents in focus groups, in the parent association meetings. Uh, every single student in the high school has had an opportunity uh, and in fact has given us input about the process through a roundtable discussion group that we had a month or so ago. Uh, every community member in the community has had an opportunity during election day to complete a survey uh, that we administered to people who were willing after a long process of voting to spend a few minutes uh, to give us some input about our mission statement. Uh, the faculty have all been involved in it. Uh, a number of faculty members, and you have their names, have been involved in the actual regular weekly meetings that we've been holding since the beginning of school. And the entire faculty had an opportunity to vote on this document and approve the document overwhelmingly um, the Monday before the Thanksgiving break, uh, the Tuesday before the Thanksgiving break. And then there have been several school board members um, who have been a part of the latter stages of the process leading to this draft language as well. So it's been a, a in a short period of time, uh, I feel confident that we've got a pretty good uh, input from all the stakeholders uh, in the high school community. So that's led to the language that's before you, and I wanted to address briefly what the significance, I think, is of the language and why I feel uh, good about bringing it before you. And the first reaction of, bringing, of looking at language like this, I would assume, for people who haven't been a part of the process, um, is, it m would I imagine be something like, well, this sounds like mom and apple pie. Why is this, um, how is this going to make any difference to anything? Um, and there is a lot of truth in the fact that it does sound like mom and apple pie, but that doesn't make it necessarily a bad thing. Uh, in fact, it probably makes it a good thing in a lot of ways. But unlike previous mission statements, if any board members have ever been th involved uh, through an accreditation process involving schools leading to the creation of a mission, this is not a menu of, of information generated by each of the academic departments in the high school. It's not a compromised document where the math department throws in a couple of things that they think are important, the social studies department throws in a couple of things, and everybody sort of gets their, um, their major interest sort of represented in a mission statement, which then really doesn't serve the purpose of prioritizing what's the most important that we really need to focus on. 
across classrooms and across content areas. So what's different about this document is, is even though it sounds like mom and apple pie, everybody in the high school, the teachers have said, we'll be responsible for a part of that mom and apple pie. Uh, we'll be responsible for, sh for sharing responsibility for helping kids read better, write better, present better, according to some common standards and using some common language in the way we talk to kids about those things. So I think it is really important in that sense. Um, the second significance really does lie in the fact that we are, as a staff, asking to be held accountable uh, by you and by the community for developing a consistent language and a consistent set of criteria for measuring how our students are doing with respect to those important, critically important skill areas. It's different in, in one no very notable respect from the learning results work that the school is doing, although it dovetails in many ways nicely with the learning results work. Um, the learning results still do adhere to sort of the traditional content area compartment <coughs> that we're all used to. So there's math learning results, and there's English learning results, and there's science learning results, and there's social studies learning results. What the accreditation agency is, is encouraging schools to do in looking at mission statements is essentially to kind of blast apart those compartments so that there will be some, again, prioritized areas that everybody is looking at. So that, for example, in the teaching of writing, we have a lot of teachers in all of our departments uh, who place a really heavy emphasis on writing and developing writing proficiency. What we don't have and what most schools do not have is across curricular areas and from classroom to classroom, even within curricular areas, we don't necessarily have a common language with which we talk to kids about what's good writing, what's bad writing, what's mediocre writing, how can you improve, and we don't have necessarily common assessments. And so what this proposes to do is, beginning with the adoption of the mission, is to really get us to work on developing that common language, those common criteria, and forcing us, once we begin to generate some data under that, to figure out what do we do, how do we respond to kids who are struggling in a systematic, school-wide way, and not just an individual teacher way, um, but, it, but in a school-wide. The third, I think, to me, uh, one of the, and one of the big areas is the identification of one of those apple pie statements relating to reading as a priority area at the high school, because the truth is that uh, there is probably no teacher, with the exception perhaps in the special ed department, who's had any significant skill training in teaching kids, helping kids to understand how to go about comprehending passages that we ask them to understand, um, that we assign to them as homework, as, as readings for novels or, or whatever it might be. Traditionally, high school faculties have um, uh, both here and everywhere, have been able to assume that students come to us with certain sort of baseline level of skills in terms of decoding and comprehension. And this really says that we can't really do business that way um, any longer, that we, we have to develop our own skills to help students with the increasingly sophisticated reading demands that they, they're faced with, particularly as they're faced with going through the learning results um, and meeting those requirements. So it's a huge task, and it's probably the biggest task um, the biggest task, I think, immediate task that this mission statement will present to us is really bringing our faculty up to speed on how to help <coughs> students with that area of reading comprehension, which is so critical and cuts across so many areas. Approval tonight, if that's what the board gives us, uh, will be the beginning of a process whereby we as a faculty and staff develop, make, develop common understandings around these issues, these areas of academic expectations, and a common responsibility to take seriously the issue of what happens with students who struggle. Um, but even for the most talented academic students, I would maintain that there's a strong benefit in you know, being able to go from classroom to classroom across content areas and face common language so that their skills can be brought even to a higher level than we might otherwise expect. I focus today uh, in my comments on the academic expectations of the document because in many ways I think that's the newest, it's the most different um, area. Uh, that, that the accreditation agency asks us to really focus on. Uh, there remains work to be done in developing in what, what NIASC is calling the indicators of whether or not we're accomplishing the civic and social expectations piece of what we've identified in the mission statement. Um, even a statement, for example, as simple as 
we, are, we expect students to treat others the way they like to be treated is, in many respects, the most apple pie statement in the thing. But if we actually did that, and that were part of the climate of any school, um, it's going to open up a whole variety of discussions, I think, with students about what does that mean? Uh, because that's not necessarily the first, first um, instinct that we have, even though abstractly, on an abstract level, we might say, of course we believe in that. But what does it really mean when push comes to shove? So there's work to do in that area, too. I haven't focused on that. If anybody has any questions, I would certainly be glad to um, talk with you about it. I would urge the board to adopt the draft mission statement. I believe it's consistent with the district's mission and vision and the future direction plan, which was one of the first documents that we looked to when we began our process of trying to define uh, what our mission statement ought to be. It sets a prioritized course of action and attention for the entire high school faculty. It articulates in a way that will bring about greater accountability around an issue that we've all talked about again and again over the last few years, a concern about the education of all of our students, um, from the quickest to the slowest and the naturally brightest to the hardest workers to the most challenged. Um, I think it's an exciting document. I think it's a challenging document. And I'd be glad to answer any questions that the board might have about the process or the content or what remains to be done from here. Um, I'm, I've never seen our old one. I assume we had to have an old one, right? Um, you probably don't. I, everybody has it, I think, at the school board workshop. I distributed it. It probably didn't catch your attention. It's, it's essentially a long... Oh, in, in the last... Yep, in the last yeah. school board workshop. was part of that package of documents that I presented. But I didn't spend much, if any, time looking at it. It was just a, a quick... Okay. Does this differ significantly? It differs very significantly. Okay. Differs very significantly from it. The last document really was, I mean, there's clearly some overlap. There always will be in developing a mission statement. But this is a prioritized statement that says these are the things we really need to spend some significant time on. The other document more closely resembled a little bit from here, and a little bit from mm -hmm. here, and a little bit from okay. somewhere else. And uh, the other question I had is um, we are approving this verbatim, right? Because the grammar police wonders if there should be a comma in here. I suspect we could, if the board would like to add a comma, that I could probably I'll, could I'll do that, and then we could just make that change. <laughs> it's not going to change the subject. Okay. Should there be one after graduation there? In the middle of the, at the bottom of academic expectations? Yes. Yes, it should be. Okay. I'm the grammar I just wanted to to comment that I like this mission statement because anybody can pick this up in this community, whether you're a high school student or <coughs> the parent of a high school student and really know it's, you know, and even if you're not involved in the school, it makes sense to you and you can really understand it. And it's just so clear and concise that, you know, the whole community can really, could stand behind this. And in addition to that, I just want to say, I had the opportunity to sit in on a couple of the mission committee meetings, just the last two. So most of the work had been done. But you've really already said this, Jeff, but it's important for the community to know that this is really, it's a huge undertaking, the accreditation process. It's not that we have a choice in the matter, but I mean, I was really impressed with the commitment on the part of the committee members. And, you know, this document looks so simple, but a lot of time and really thoughtful discussion went into it. And I think that the process that you've brought about involving the students and, you know, all the faculty is, is really commendable. So thanks. Thank you. Kevin? To echo pretty much what Anna said, um, first of all, as school board members, we don't often get the chance to work with faculty committees. And it was a wonderful opportunity to get gain insights into the high school faculty. But also, I mean, to watch the process in work, the passion of our faculty members, not to mention our administrators that were involved, was just outstanding. I, I mean, it, it, may, it helped make you ultimately, when you step back and looked at the big picture, made you feel good about what the faculties was doing and what their intentions were. And it was not an easy series of conversations, let me assure you. Um, there was some, uh, Jeff and I smiled during some of his comments um, about language and jargon, and there was a lot of conversation about making this a simple document that 
the entire community. And when I say the community, I mean the entire community, not just the school community, but Cape Elizabeth could embrace, and I think that that's achieved. And the other thing that I want to congratulate the faculty on at the high school, finally, is for recognizing the issue, the, the reading issue. I, I think that's just a quantum leap forward, no longer assuming that students entering the high school read well and reflectively. Thank you, and I also, I mean, I think that the result of, of what transpired in many hours of agonizing over words, literally words that went into this, um, is wonderful and it is very readable by everyone. I have a different take. Um, I'm a little curious after all the work that diversity didn't find its way into the language, the word diversity. Um, particularly given the fact that our state ranks 50th in the country in diversity, and given the fact that I think it's a universal value and, and that if the school system wants to, as we indicate in our direction plan, to be the top, one of the top school systems in the country, why wouldn't we take the lead and put that language in a document such as that? I think, Richard, I, I haven't memorized the, um, the list of indicators under, if I'm understanding your question correctly, under civic and social expectations, uh, the work that remains to be done is to identify indicators for how we're doing in each of those areas in terms of uh, ethical and responsible behavior, treating others the way we would like to be treated, and those sorts of things. And if I remember correctly, the word diversity it features fairly prominently in those. In, but in the mission statement aspect. itself. The, for instance, the mission statement oh. itself. I, 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 I certainly, I've been involved in a lot of mission statements, and particularly in public school systems, we almost have this um, innate commitment to making sure we look beyond our own lens of understanding. And it, you, you may be getting at it with the phrase respect for others. Um, not exactly sure. I, I know the difficulty of using vague language but also to make sure there's parameters, but I think the word diversity has a much more powerful tone to it. Um, Respect is, uh, how that gets fleshed out in the classroom, I'm not sure. I, obviously, you're probably working with classroom interaction patterns, examples used in class, uh, textbook selection, um, uh, uh, assignments, those kinds of things. But I, I just, I would really um, be very concerned about a mission statement in this district does that, that does not have the word diversity in its mission statement. And given the fact that we are a state that is the most homogenous state in the country, I think it's even more incumbent upon us to address this issue head on in a mission statement. These are our students, more than 90% of whom are going on to colleges, which are much more diverse, obviously, in most cases, than the town of Cape Elizabeth. And by diversity, I'm, I'm talking about a number of issues, race, sexual identity, uh, sexual identity sex, uh, spiritual diversity, um, among others. Has that ever entered into the conversation all this time? Uh, it, to be honest with you, it really was not a word that entered in at the level of the mission statement itself. Um, I think people were, I'm, I'm sure that that's part of what's implicit within the notion of respect for others. Um, that encompasses everybody. Um, so there was not a specific discussion about specifically using that word. I think the concept was there, but that word was not part of the discussion. I believe it is, as I mentioned, I know we're getting back to the other issue, but I think it is in the other part uh, in terms of the, the, the indicators under the civic and social expectations. So. But as a parent, I'd want to go into a community and see a mission statement that does say we are a community that embraces diverse points of view and diverse peoples. And that's not reflected in this current mission statement, that kind of intonation. Okay, well, I, I think that, you know, we're here to either approve this mission statement as it is, um, or you can certainly make a motion to have, um, that have that issue brought up and, and we can take a vote on it that way well, or for the approval the way it is. Well, no, I, I'm not really hearing other people that are for these. Well, I, I, I can laud the approach and I, I don't want to kind of shut down the process, but I, I'm actually stunned that the word didn't find itself in any dialogue because 
i'm out there dancing as fast as i can at the higher ed level presuming that the students coming from the secondary level understand this process and it just may be my issue no it is work i think now that you mention it in our future direction planning initiative it was a major issue the lack of diversity and the lack of understanding about diversity so i i i tend to agree with you i don't want i don't know if it has to be somewhere in here and it's also a major policy issue for us this year um and I don't know if that's, and I don't know what your timeline is, and maybe that's a discussion that just for whatever reason didn't take place, but it was a major component in both our future direction planning initiatives. We had all those charts on the wall and everything. It was a major issue. Um, so I don't know, I don't know how it's addressed, but I don't think, I, I just not, the open not as you bring it up, no, and I, I don't think it should be ignored. I have a quick question though, just to clarify what Richard's asking. Are you asking for something in here that um, imparts knowledge of diversity or a respect for diversity? Because I think, I'm not sure knowledge of diversity belongs in here. I, I would even, the language may be respect diversity. Yeah. I, I don't think the word diversity is really kind of an, an, an anomaly. People know what the word means. Right, no, but I, I... And I think maybe it's respecting diversity. Maybe that's the language. Okay, because I think but that those are two different things. Knowledge of... Knowledge of is, is not so important. Okay, that's yeah. that's what I was getting at. But I, I, I want to make clear, though, if the sentiment of the group, I'm, I'm not about to block the process here because of my... an issue that I truly firmly believe in in my heart. I just think that as these dialogues continue, that that whoever it is that's facilitating needs to put that right out in front. Mm -hmm. If I'm affiliated with a, 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 a group of schools that proudly claim that they want to be in the top public school systems in the country but don't have the word diversity in the mission statement, at least one of the schools, then that's something that concerns me. And I hope that as this continues along that that becomes one of the talking points. If, if the board wishes to, um if the board are getting back to Marie's suggestion, if you want us to go back and have a consideration of that, I think we could do that without slowing down the remainder of the work that we need to do. That's up to the board. Uh, all, I, all I need for purposes of tonight in terms of triggering some other work that we have to do under the parts that we have to go forward on is, is an acceptance, I think, of the rest, if that's okay. Obviously, there's always the possibility that the board could reject the whole thing, and we, we go back to square one, and that's part of the process. And we can certainly do that. But I don't hear you talking about that. There may be a middle ground if you'd like us to, to, to sit down and consider that. I'm, I'm sensitive to the process, extremely sensitive. I'm sensitive to the most powerful phrase in this, at least one of them, approved by the faculty and how much time that takes to get approval. And I, I do understand that process. Um, I would be satisfied in some kind of future document that, that the word appears um, clearly. I mean, Writing, yes. Reading, yes. Critical thinking, yes. These are all the components. They're checklists. Um, these are the essential ingredients for success as a, as a member of our communities. Um, tolerance, those kinds of things, I don't know. I'm not sure we can even have uh, well, standards there. I mean, you might be, first question is, does anything get delayed if we don't approve this till next month? That's what I want to know. I'm guessing not. Um, no, but it would be good to be able to have at least a show of support right. for, for the other, the okay. academic expectations in particular, because that, that's where a lot of okay. work has to happen in the next four to six weeks. Okay. But couldn't we approve this as is pending, or not even pending, but that if we wanted to recommend that you consider something like that as an addition to this in play, you know, in this document? Uh, well, are, are we saying that, that we want to have Jeff go back and consider the word diversity in the mission statement. Is that what we're saying? Well, I guess what I, I mean, but I, don't. I no, think but I that, know if everybody. I think that Richard has a good point, and I think you could easily just say respect for others and their diversity. But I think and, it's up to the committee whole, to wordsmith that. Right, right, yeah. right. But I mean, I don't think it's to redo it shouldn't be that big a deal because I really think you could probably accomplish that just adding those few words, but I also don't want to hold you up. I think that but, but Jeff, isn't this really um, three parts? I, I mean, the way that the group went about it, it was the mission statement, then it was the academic 
expectations and then the civic and social expectations. So if we were to say that the academic expectations and the social expectations, we can approve, we can approve those and we'd like you to look at the mission statement and consider the word diversity. Would that does that work? That works for me. Yes. I mean, I think there's any number of process, processes that could be adopted. Okay. My major concern is that if the board is in agreement with the rest of it, that we can, that's, because yes. that really is where the, the bulk of the work remains to be done by us. Within those two pieces? Yes. Right. So is that something that is acceptable for everyone? Just I, a question of how people are feeling. During this process, as you may recall, there were several issues that came up that were not set aside per se, but they were handled in a higher level of document, i.e., in this case, the future direction plan, which encompasses the school district. And that's where the statement is that we will be one of the best, highest performing um, districts in the country. and. That came out of future directions, and as Tom has already said, I know if through all of those future direction planning meetings, diversity was a hot topic. But what I'm having problem, since I don't have the pamphlet Richard has right now, recalling how that was slotted in to the future direction plan document. And if it's, if it's, in the, if it's not in there, it should be in there. As the override, as a part of an overriding document for the entire district, regardless of whether it's high school, Pond Cove, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I recognize um, the point, and I, I've raised that issue in some of our meetings uh, on some of the things that I've observed. Um, so I am absolutely not opposed to incorporating that in this document and or any other lower level mission statement if it's not if it's not covered and even if it is covered I don't have a issue with it but I would be I would be willing also at this time to say to Jeff at least in terms of the academic expectations we have no issues if that's the case I haven't heard that yet but full speed ahead go with that piece and then do what needs to be done on, on the balance. But I, my only concern was I thought that I sort of, we, we as a group didn't touch on it because it was dealt with in a higher level. No, I, I think when, in, in, in our August retreat, that was one of the issues that the group, the 250 people felt needed to be addressed right. further in our future direction plan. So, and that's why I, I agree with Richard that it, that it needs to be addressed there um, because that came out loud and clear in our retreat that we needed to, to make more of an effort in that area in our future direction plan. Um, but I also think the, the mission statement at the high school is really a reflection of what the high school is all about. It does fall under the umbrella of the future direction plan, but this short little statement should be very powerful and you should be able to read that and walk away with what that school is about. And, and I think it's a very good point when in talking to students, even in the walkthroughs last year, the issue of diversity came up, um, not only the lack of it, but the lack of understanding about it. Um, it was a, was a real issue for kids. So I tend to agree that somehow there should be some dialogue about that. And, and there might be an answer as to where it is and why it's not there, but, but I, I think it's important. So can we move to accept the presentation of the academic expectations as well as the civic and social expectations. This yes. is one are motion. You, yes, are to, you making that I'll motion? I'll make that motion to okay. move to accept um, the uh, high school's uh, statement on academic expectations as well as civic and social expectations okay. together. Do we have a second? Okay, Kevin. Well, I have a question. Do we have to make asking them to look at Diversity part of the same motion, or is that or is a separate it a motion? Should, should we just yeah, be a, and request, and, request and, and request to review the mission? The mission I'm a good statement. listener. The aspect of diversity is part of the mission. Yes, review uh, 
aspects associated with diversity as part of its mission statement. Okay. And the second was Kevin, correct? Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay, all those in favor? Seven zero. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thanks, Thank you, Jeff. Jeff. Very much. Um, okay, where are we? Okay, next on our list is, um, as Elaine mentioned earlier, um, the technology uh, lease for system-wide administrative software. Um, and this is the student information system uh, from PowerSchool that was agreed on by um, the administrative team. Um, and we, actually we have already authorized them to move forward and purchase um, the PowerSchool software at a previous meeting. And do, are we, do you want us to take a vote? Yeah, at on this time what you're doing is, and there's a wording about the lease, I think that um, the motion would include the, that's included in the packet, right, Pauline? Yeah, there's. So the, the wording that's in the packet is the wording that we need to use, not that you have to read the whole thing. But this just, whole thing? Right. That's the vote. And okay. so what you're approving is the lease. Okay. I think we've done this for the technology lease and other leases. All right. Okay, Kevin? I move that we adopt the technology lease as described in the document and include the document as part of the record of this meeting. Okay. Um, and a second? Second. Uh, Anne, uh, any comments or questions? Um, all those in favor? Um, seven zero. Okay. Uh, and next on our list is the um, contractual agreement with HKTA Architects um, for the construction of an addition to Pond Cove. Um, and we are approving that with pending approval um, with our legal counsel. Um, so can we have a motion um, to authorize that contract? Kevin? I move that we adopt the contract as per the, um, here we go again, I'm having one of those moments, as per the exhibit. Uh, pending uh, review and final approval by our legal counsel. Okay, and a second? Second. And uh, any questions or comments? No. Okay, all those in favor? Uh, seven zero. Okay, and, and next on our list um, is the policy um, for conflict of interest and nepotism. and. Who will, Tom or uh, Tom? Um, the policy committee met and reviewed um, reviewed the changes and the suggestions of um, um, Drummond and Woodson as they reviewed the policies. They combined both policies into one, um, checked all the legal <coughs> citations. Um, I have attached a memo because in my reviewing and I, and I didn't want to do anything to the policy um, per se because as I reviewed it after the policy committee meeting um, I noticed under Roman numeral number one board members that the legal citation if you if you look at the statute um, is, is not accurate in the way that we cite it um, in the revised policy, um, that the legal citation seven is that the board member or spouse of a board member may not be an employee in the Cape Luther School Department. The immediate family piece of that um, is not included in uh, the statute under uh, number seven. So that's why I took the liberty of separating them out so that the citation is accurate. So it says the same thing just worded differently so that it's accurate according to the statute. And the other piece, there was quite a discussion at the policy committee meeting because we, in, in regarding school board members, uh, the superintendent, um, in each of those, in the Drummond Woodson um, suggestions they gave us, they had e exemptions to each of those that 
basically spoke to any one that was in that situation and as of the prior to this policy being adopted would be grandfathered, so to speak. And what the policy committee said, well, no, we don't have anyone in those positions. There's no school board members who have a member of their immediate family working in the district, so we could eliminate the exemption because it doesn't exist. As I reviewed it, we do have, though, a situation where there is an administrator has a member of their immediate family working within their jurisdiction, so that we do need to include that exemption for that particular one, that an immediate or extended family member who are employed as of the date of this policy adoption would be exempt for so long as they remain continuously employed. We would continue to operate as we have, that the administrator does not evaluate or supervise that person, but that in this particular case, there is someone who is in that jurisdiction working in the same building, so we would need the exemption for that one. We cut all the exemptions out because we didn't think anything existed, and as I read it, I said, no, but we do have one that exists. That's why I made that amendment. Tom, didn't the original one have a thing in there that you could be employed, but it had to be with full knowledge and they couldn't evaluate the family member? Isn't that? I don't remember. You could be employed? Right. For the immediate family? For extended family. Extended family. But you couldn't be the evaluator and it had to be fully disclosed. In terms of what type of relationship? Well, any immediate or extended family. In all categories? In other words, I think I agreed it was some language in there and it's still in here in terms of a situation of a principal or someone like that hiring a teacher. Right. Okay. So I think that language is still in here. But this? But extended to immediate family. But this one's saying that they shall not be employed. And that's different. And they're in that jurisdiction. So that jurisdiction would be a principal's jurisdiction is that building. Right. And that's different than what we have now. Right. We talked about that in the policy committee. That's what the recommendation of Drummond Woodson was, this language. Okay. I think. Except that, if I understood correctly, anybody who's in that position right now is grandfathered? Right. Yes. Yeah. I'm just, I guess that's something I want to think about. So for the next policy meeting. So I'll. Okay. Yeah, we have a chance and that's why we need to get all of these issues out on the table. Right. It is a complicated one. And I think another issue that's come to my attention is that the policy committee has to have a conversation about community services. Because community services is part of the school system. It's also part of the town. Now, in our policy, we could exempt community services because it's just, it's, I think we're one of the few places I know of where either recreation programs or community services programs are part of the school. And I guess that's been that way because of the connection with transportation and used to be custodians and is no longer. So the only real, and the adult education, which basically doesn't exist. So maybe that's a discussion at some other time we need to have about that relationship with community services and the schools. But that's another issue regarding, I don't know, the number of kids that are, that work for, that there could be children of school board members or administrators that work for community services in their summer program. Has that ever happened? Oh, yeah. So that's another, I mean, and I guess it's whether we're, what we consider community services to be. So that's something the policy committee needs to discuss. But the concern there is, I'm sorry, Marie. 
Um, no, just to, I mean, this may be a silly question, but have we ever considered community services in any policies that we've written? No. It, for anything? No. And I mean, because I, I think when we think of... Facilities, it's a discussion we need to have. Yeah. I think it's a discussion maybe we need to have with the, with the town council at some point. Is where community services, I think by their nature, they were located in the schools. Um, that, and the adult education piece was a big piece. It was it, way back was considered part of the schools. Um, I think the connection is very loose right now. Um, and maybe we need to have that conversation as to where does communities, is it a community program, which I think it, it is, or is it a school program? And we just don't see it as a school program. <coughs> And they have a separate budget. They're not part of our budget, but they're not part of the town budget. They're but state. they also report to they us report, when they yeah. report on our budget, but we don't, you know, the, that relationship has always been very funky to me. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a, that's a, a conversation, you know, that, that needs to happen. Was, mm -hmm. uh, assuming someone raised that issue to you, was the concern over the, for example, the part-time summer employees mm -hmm. right. who are, Typically, my 14, 15, 16 year old kids. Exactly. So, I mean, even if we were backed into a corner, not backed into a corner, but even if an agreement was made that we would do that, could we exempt those part time but, but it's just not in the house right now. Exactly. Right. Well, the other thing is the, is the description of, of volunteers and how, you know, you think of right. all the volunteers that there are in community service that are related to. <coughs> other town employees or school board members. Um, so if you, you want to be clear on that. There was another question that came up at the policy committee about volunteers, and I did check with um, our attorneys about that. Um, their feeling was um, the policy, um, the statement about volunteers and the statute about volunteers refers to volunteers. School board members cannot uh, take on a volunteer responsibility where there is um, direct supervision or they directly report to uh, an administrator of the district. Um, their feeling on that is that would be for things like if you wanted to volunteer um, to coach a particular team, uh, you couldn't do that uh, because then you would be reporting directly to the athletic administrator. Um, but if you were volunteering in a classroom, that's okay. Um, there's a question about uh, organizing an event um, that's okay, but if it's a, something that is normally a paid position that someone else is doing, um, or something that is a position that exists that normally is supervised uh, in a formal manner, then those would be the kinds of things that the statute is looking at, not the normal uh, parent volunteer type things that happen in classrooms and helping to organize an event or whatever that might be. So and several would we of us made some suggestions on language for that. Did you, did you, were you able to have the specific language suggested checked with the attorneys? Yes. Yeah. So was there anything in that it worked? Yeah, well, they, the, the language that's in the statute, it's just, a, I guess, um, the suggestion is the language in the statute, um, what we would do and they're going to do for us is to add on a sense or something that would better interpret that so that's, that's what I, clear. I, that's so, what I'm talking about. Right, so some future board that looks at it would be clear about what this is. And we understand now because we've been told, but what we'll get from them is some sort of a sentence to add in there. So it'll be like we talked about giving some examples of whatever that might right. be. Right, so or we, you know, one of the things was the umbrella statement that this, this applied to positions that would otherwise be compensated positions. Right. Well, and, like and, and I think where you're talking is under employment, under B, 3, and 4, um, where I think <coughs> it, in those areas, if, if those were the places where you gave those examples right. that you just mentioned, and actually in 4 it does say that, that yep. you want to specify what types of volunteer activities. Yep. Um, so that would make it clear. Okay, is there anything else? Nothing. Okay. So this will go back to the policy committee and will come back to us next month um, as a second reading. Okay. Um, 
and oh, that's it. That's it. We would like to, though, at the end of this meeting, go back into our um, finance meeting. Um, there were several things um, that we didn't have a chance to discuss, and, and it probably won't take longer than 15, 20 minutes. Okay. So before we adjourn this meeting, I'd just like to go over some dates for some future meetings. Um, policy Subcommittee, Tuesday, January 6th, 12th noon, here in the Jordan Conference Room. The next Building Committee meeting will be Wednesday, January 7th, 7 o'clock, here in the Jordan Conference Room. Finance Subcommittee um, and the next School Board meeting, um, Tuesday, January 13th, 6.30 for the finance meeting and 7.30 our regular meeting. Um, and that's it for tonight. I have a motion to adjourn. Oh, I'm sorry. We need a motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion. Okay. Richard, um, and a second. Jennifer, all those in favor? 7-0. Thank you.